take our Bibles this evening. You know, God does sometimes, you know, there's sometimes people, you know, and, and you look at Jacqueline's life, you know, we have others just like Jacqueline. And others that come and share their testimonies of how God has dramatically changed their life. And we deal with people who really are struggling in their lives, their marriages, their homes. Their, but, you know, the first thing I'm going to have to realize is I need to understand I've got to learn to submit myself to God and ask God the question. Rather than getting angry and upset and snorting, snomping, screaming, yelling, and going on. So tonight, I want you to take your Bibles Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, if you would. 1 Peter chapter 5. Then we're going to turn over to Romans 15. And tonight I'm going to speak to you about one of the greatest failures of our lives. Now if I said to you uh, what, what, the, what that failure is right at this moment, you would look at me and say, what? One of the greatest failures of our lives. Let's stand together as we read out of respect to God in His Word, 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to start reading with verse 6. The word humble here says, Humble yourselves, therefore under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. The word humble here means to submit. Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's turn back to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And I want to look at verse 4. And then in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, the Bible says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That means before you and I got here. That we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have what, folks? hope. And now, verse 13, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Let's begin by having a word of prayer. Our gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the opportunity that is ours to come here to this place. Thank you for this church. Thank you for Pastor Randall and our friendship. Thank you for uh, the assistant pastors and their families. And God, I pray now that you will just work in our hearts. I pray that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher. I submit myself to you now. Pray that my mind and my heart will be yours. And God, I pray if there's a person here tonight who's unsaved, that they'll come to know you as Savior this evening. I pray if there's a person here that is out of fellowship with you, that is struggling in their mind about making choices that are incorrect and not honoring to you. I pray, God, that you will work in their heart tonight. Help them to realize that their fellowship needs to be restored, not uh, obliterated. And Father, I pray that you will help them and encourage them. And I pray tonight, God, work in every one of our hearts. Yeah, help us to have compassion upon others. And God, help us to be able to see what we need to see tonight for each person. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. One of the greatest failures of our lives, and I want to tell you what it is. But I want to ask a question first, because you know, Brother Lopez, I always ask questions. Okay? How many of you have ever been frustrated? <laughs> Raise your hand for me if you've ever been frustrated. Amen. You guys are an honest group. Amen. Because I'm telling you what, if you didn't raise your hand, you're lying. All right, now, but here's my point with you. 
one of the greatest failures of our lives dealing with frustration. And tonight we're going to see just how wicked that is. And how God wants us to understand that He does not wish for us to live in frustration. He wants us to have a real, intimate, personal and passionate relationship with Him. And we need to learn to ask God questions. So one of the tools that He's given us. You know, there are, there are examples of people in the Bible who ask God questions. David was one. I don't have time to go back there tonight, but I will later this week. But I want you to notice something with me right now. I want you to look at Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. And we always start off reading these passages too. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why we got into biblical counseling is because I knew that we needed to help other people and we needed to give them real answers and not just tell them that we'll read your Bible. Okay? Real answers. Notice verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So that means that you've got to get into people's lives. You know, sometimes there's times I wish I didn't have to get that deep into somebody's life. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now, let is at the start of verse 2, so it says, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to what, folks? Edification, building them up. You've got to make a decision to be an edifier. You've got to make a decision to be an edifier. A builder up of people rather than tearing down of people. Verse 3 says, for even Christ pleased not Himself. He's our great example in this. He came to the cross and died for us that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And He was buried and He rose again the third day. I've been to Israel. I see the place. I've seen the place that they believe He was buried. You know, Golgotha's on the top up here. Right below it is the tomb that they believe that he was buried in. And even you can go in there and see the place. I, I pictured it in my mind before I went to Israel that it was farther away than that. Or in a different place. That's right below it. Hewn in the side of Golgotha. So Christ pleased not himself. So why should we you understand the point? He gave Himself for us, so we should need to give ourselves to help others. Instead of being selfish. But as is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Christ says. Now, I want you to pay particular attention to verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime. Now, that means they were written before we got here. Were written for our what? So God wants you to be a learner. Remember this morning I said, I determined in my life I wanted to be a learner. So God wants you and me to be learners. That we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So, God not only wants you to learn, He wants you to have patience. Think about it for a minute. Patience, frustration. Just think about that for a minute. Notice it says that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures. So I want to ask you a question now. 
given what we just read, where is the answer to your life found? In the scriptures, amen. So we want our counselees to see that the answer for your life is not in living by your emotions. Not by ranting and raving and screaming and yelling and saying, this is not fair. And I realize that, you know, people treat each other poorly because they're immature. Spiritually immature and emotionally immature. But one of the things I tell our counselees is this. You have to learn. You have to learn to not maximize everything. Because immediately you need to stop, think, turn it over to God, and so minimize it rather than maximize it. You know, for some people, if somebody says something that they don't like, oh, oh, what's so bad? It's bad because you're making it worse than it really is. Then on the other side, you know, there are people that you know, they have no responsibility. They don't take any responsibility for themselves. You know, they don't take any responsibility for anything. I have to learn to focus my life to become a person that is growing and becoming spiritually mature. And if I become spiritually mature, I'm going to become emotionally mature. Amen? Amen. Instead of letting... So in essence, many times when people come in for marriage counseling, listen carefully to me now, they run everything through their emotions. Okay? Everything is running through the emotion pit. You know? So in essence... If my wife didn't pick up something tonight that, you know, she's supposed to, you know, we're going to blow our lid and we're going to stomp and yell and scream and rant and rave or vice versa. Now, are you a perfect person? Have you ever forgot anything? Now, is Pastor Knudsen, he's never forgot a thing, has he? <laughs> there you go. All right. But the whole point of it is, I can maximize something to the point that, oh, they're, they always, now listen to me. They always do this, and they never do that, and that's always an exaggeration. You know, if you say to your wife, you never do this, and your wife says to you, well, you always do that. It's always an exaggeration. It's a part of being spiritually and emotionally immature. And God wants you to grow up. He wants you to learn how to be a spiritually emotion to keep your emotions under control by the power of the Holy Spirit rather than run everything through your emotions. Now, I want you to look and notice it says that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So what's God's Word say about this? But one of the things is, listen, listen. God's Word doesn't say that you should go out and buy a Kia. Right? I have not found that there. Now, there are some principles about buying and those kinds of things. But, you know, I have to learn to ask God questions. And God wants, you know, if, if God cares for the little birds, and He knows the number of hairs on our head, and Brother Chris and I are losing those, so, you know... He didn't have to count too far on our head, does he, brother? All right? And you know what? So he cares, and he wants you to submit yourself to him 
And he wants you to understand that he cares and he wants to help you, so ask him the question. You know, anytime having a relationship with God, it's about this. You know, I talk, you know when you have a relationship, you talk and you listen. And you listen and you talk. Now, when I met Kim, I wanted to have a relationship with her. So, I wanted to listen to what she had to say. And I believe she wanted to have a relationship with me, so she wanted to hear what I had to say. So, we need to, though, what we need to communicate as spirit controlled people, you know. And, you know, one of the things in, in marital relationships is this. You know, your husband may be doing something that you don't like. Or your wife may be doing something that you don't like. And it causes you to get frustrated. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this. How many of you have ever been frustrated by your mate? Now, come on. How many of you don't care? Okay, all right, I got it. But the whole point here is this, ladies and gentlemen. All right, frustration. Now, comfort of the Scriptures that you might have hope. And one of the things that we try to get across to people is God wants you to have hope in your life. He wants you to have hope. Just... Do you think Jacqueline has hope now very, very, very where she was before? And we got a lot of people like that. Now turn over to verse 15, or 13, Romans 15, 13. Notice what it says. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, this is a huge verse for us. Now, the God of hope. So, He is the God of hope. Amen? Now, the God of hope fill who? You and me with all. Now, notice what God wants you to have. Joy and peace. So, this verse says, God wants you to have hope, joy, and peace. So, but you've got to make the decision. It, God didn't create us without a will. So we need to make choices in our life. So now you've got to make a choice to have hope, joy, and peace. Now, but I want you to notice the next phrase there. You see that set where it says, in believing? You see it in your Bible? Okay. You're going to have to believe that He really does want you to have that. In believing. Now, notice, not only does He want you to have hope, that ye may abound in hope. Now, what picture comes to your mind when you think about abounding? Now, I, want you to, I want you to picture in your mind right now abounding, what you think it means. Now, I've had counselors say I, overflowing. Well, I think that's a good answer. Okay? Now, I tell you what I picture in my mind. I grew up in Indiana. Any Hoosiers in here? One back in the back, my wife. Okay? And in the end, they grow corn. Miles and miles and miles of it. And, you know, you go out there in the summer and it is green, it's beautiful, and it's waving back and forth, and it's just mile after mile after mile after mile of it. And then in the fall, they cut it down. And I always thought, you know, abounding to me is like running across that field, jumping in the air, and not having a care in the world. Amen? Yeah. 
So many times we let the little things become frustrating to us. Now, let's dig in here, okay? We let little things become frustrating to us. Now, we've seen that God wants you to have hope today. That's point number one. God wants you to have hope. Now, you know, every day at Hope Biblical Counseling Center, we hear about the defeat, the despair, the discouragement, the frustration, and seeming helplessness that many Christians feel are great impossibilities in their life. And many that are devastated, hurt, filled with despair and doubts and fears and worry in their lives. Now, he wants us to have hope. He wants us to abound in hope. And here is the big player in the room. Look at the last phrase in this verse. All right. Lopez. It doesn't say here through the power of Rick, does it? It does not. It says through the power of the Holy Ghost. He now is the big player in the room. And I have to understand that. So I have to embrace the Holy Spirit in my life. And we're not talking about the charismatic movement. I'm, I can tell you right now, I know for a fact, without even asking Brother Gary, he is not going to allow nobody to run up and down these aisles and hoot like a freight train. And he is definitely not going to let anybody run up and down these aisles and chew carpet. Nothing like that. Okay? That's excessive emotion. But I, but I do have to understand, the moment I got saved, the Holy Spirit came to indwell me, and He came to fill me. He came to do at least 70 different things in my life, and I need to embrace that. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that I'm going to live a life honoring and pleasing to God, rather than griping, moaning, complaining, gossiping, backbiting, being a critical spirit. I have to understand that I have to submit myself to the Holy Spirit, who is the big player in this room. God, the Holy Spirit. Who loves you so much, He wants to help you. But He's not going to help you if you're not going to submit to Him. You know, He can be grieved. He can be quenched. Grieved means He's hurt. You hurt Him because you ignore Him. And you quench Him because of your wickedness. And no acknowledgement of Him in your life. So now I'm going to ask God the question whenever something comes up, how do you want me to pray about that? Now you know this morning I said Jeremiah 17.9 says that our hearts are desperately wicked. Who can know it? Verse 10 says, I, God, search the heart. Now turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at this powerful verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. Now if I read that verse, I say, okay. But then I read verse 10. Now watch what it says. Look what it says. But God hath revealed them unto us by His, what? Spirit. Capital S. Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things. All things. Yea, the deep things of God. So, this morning, before I came over here, 
I asked God the Holy Spirit to search my heart to show me if there was any sin that stands between me and Him. And then I asked God the Holy Spirit to show me if there was any hurt that I was allowing to control me in my life. Now listen, if you're going to let hurt control you, you're going to hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt. And you're going to blame everybody else for your hurt. And thirdly, is there, any, is there any bitterness in my heart that's standing between you and me today? Well, I'm asking God the Holy Spirit that question too. So He can search my heart and show me. So I've got to learn, Brother Rick, to ask God questions. Ask Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. So I need to ask. How do you want me to pray about this? By the way, that's one of them I ask a lot. How do you want me to pray about this? You know, one of the questions I ask the Holy Spirit is, who do you want me to be an encouragement to today? And you know what happens? That person comes right here. Who do you want me to witness to today? Now I can guarantee you this, Brother Chris, if the Holy Spirit says to you, you're going to go witness to Him today, you better get off your blessed assurance and get over there and do that. Amen? Instead of taking the shotgun approach. Now I'm okay with passing out literature and knocking on doors. I'm okay with that. But you know, I'd much rather ask God who He want me to witness to today. Have Him show me then that's going to give me a greater motivation to go and talk to that person. Amen? And then when that person gets saved, I'm going to say, all right, now I'm asking God tomorrow who He wants me to witness to. And I'm going to keep it up. Amen? Ask and it shall be given you. Now, but you know, so many times, ladies and gentlemen, we get frustrated. Something doesn't go just the way we want it to go. The first thing that comes up is frustration. Had a guy and his wife, and, and you know, uh, she used to throw things horrible. You know, she'd get so mad, she'd just throw things at him. And he told me, he says, you know, Pastor, he says, he says she got a good arm. But he says, I praise the Lord, she got bad aim. Well, why in the world would anybody want to immediately when they get frustrated throw something at somebody else? Because they're emotionally immature and not a spirit-controlled person. Here's a person who you know, takes the lid off of a Tylenol bottle and, and can't get the lid off and so they get mad and throw it at something. Frustration. We can get frustrated at little things and that causes bigger problems for us. Now, folks, God wants you to have hope. He doesn't want you to live in bitterness and it's friends, anger, criticism, and gossip and frustration. Now, without the Holy Spirit's power, you're going to fail. And did you ever notice that you can't live in peace, joy, and abound in hope without the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? Remember I said God wants you to live in peace, joy, and abound in hope. But you're not going to be able to do that unless you're submitted to the Holy Spirit. Are you submitting yourself to God the Holy Spirit each day and each moment of the day? Remember when one of those things comes up, you know, that starts the frustration, I'm going to stop, think, turn it over to God. What do you want me to praise you for? What do you want me to thank you for? I'm going to submit myself to you right now. And the moment you say I submit this to you, Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Satan wants you to be frustrated. He works at frustrating you. Now you've got to be mature enough to understand how to handle it. Now. 
Now, one of the greatest hindrances of our lives is frustration. Now, when I say that word frustration, does just hearing that word cause you to start feeling it? Now, I'll be honest. I believe that frustration is one of the sins that leads to many other sins in our lives. And when a Christian gets saved, they have all the tools of God that they need at their disposal. And the moment you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you. He now, you now have His power. However, many Christians don't plug into the power. My wife is, like I told you this morning, she's, she is really excited about RoboRock. Man, she says, that's the best thing. I want to see if they got lawnmowers like that. Okay? Now, you know what? You know, if you're, if you're in here vacuuming, and I've said this here before, so I don't know who does. I saw some people vacuuming the other day. Tell you what, you're in here vacuuming, you know, and it, you can't get pit, nothing up, nothing, the vacuum's not working. And many, have you ever thought about the fact that you just haven't plugged into the power? Think about that illustration and think about how foolish it is. But how foolish is it for us to seek to live our lives in our own power? And we haven't plugged into the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we're mad. I'm mad at my husband and I'm mad at my wife. She always does this. He never does that. Frustration. You know? Now, it's my, you know, many Christians don't plug into the power. Now, it's my desire to be a spirit-controlled person who has a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God, but I want you to hear me right now on this point. Satan tries to deceive us with frustration. Because he knows that if he can get you frustrated, you'll get out of fellowship with God. And then you'll say things that you don't want to say. Or maybe some things you've got to go back later and apologize for. Or you'll get so angry that, you know, you know, you get so angry you drop something on the floor. <gasps> you wouldn't do that, would you? Yeah, <laughs> she goes, no, no, no. Okay? And Jan, I wasn't going to pick on you this time because Jamie's not here. Okay, now, did you know that Satan is an imitator? And in Galatians 5, turn back there with me. And look at verse 22. Galatians 5, verse 22. In Galatians 5, we have the list of the fruits of the Spirit. So if I'm a Spirit-controlled person, these things are going to be evident in my life. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Love, joy, peace. Now notice the next word. Long suffering. Now I, you know, Satan's an imitator. And so God says that the fruit of the Spirit is long suffering. Meaning that when someone doesn't meet your expectations, you don't go off the, you know, you don't go off the impatience wagon, the frustration wagon, or scream and yell, rant and rave. You know, I can go to God and say, Lord, I want to turn this over to you. I want to submit myself to you, and I pray that my husband Tom will take care of that. And you might really be surprised because the next afternoon or the next morning or later on that afternoon, your husband walks in because you asked God to work in his heart and God did. And he comes in and says, Honey, I'm sorry, I forgot that. Here it is right now. Instead of you stomping around, you know, taking his food and putting it under the air conditioner and all kinds of foolishness of this nature. Okay? Seriously. 
so you're frustrated, so I'll tell you what, he's 10 minutes late, so I'm going to put that food under the air conditioner and he can just eat it when he gets home cold. Praise God for microwaves, right? Now, but you get my point? Frustration leads us to make poor choices, emotional choices, rather than going to God first. And so therefore, we're deceived by Satan into getting out of fellowship with God by allowing frustration to be in our life. Amen? Hey, woman. Hey, both sides of the fence, bro. You know, so what happens when someone or something fails to meet your expectations? You have an opportunity to respond one of two ways. Frustration, Satan's way, or long-suffering, God's way. Now honestly, folks, I think that in our biblical counseling program, that is one of the most difficult things to get people to understand. Why? Because we deal with frustration every day. Now, Brother Lopez, I'm going to take this up the ladder a little bit farther, okay? Because we deal with frustration every day. Frustration becomes a natural thing in the way a Christian deals with their life. And they don't even understand that they're falling right into the hands of Satan. Also, it really causes us to climb up the emotional ladder real quickly. And so many Christians think they can deal with frustration in the flesh daily, and it's okay. You know, they've accepted it, that it's just something that I have to deal with. You know, I, I, so in essence... I'm going to be frustrated. That's just the way it is. So big deal. No, not if I go to God. So many Christians think that they can deal with frustration in the flesh daily and it's okay. Just a way of life for them. They've never even considered what frustration really is or what it really does. When we arrived back home after one of our trips from being gone for a month, from a preaching trip, we had some problems. Everything at our house worked well when we left. And let me say this, technology is a wonderful thing when it works well. But it can be miserable when you've got to deal with getting it fixed. And how many of you have had something not work and then try to get the company responsible to fix it? You know, frustration can easily become in that scenario. So three, when we got home, not one, but three of our technology devices didn't work. You know, no one used them while we were gone. Calling customer service is a comedy of errors. As calls are dropped, you can't understand what they're saying. I'll transfer you to someone else, and they transfer you to someone else, or drop the call, and you, if you go back through the maze of press one up to nine numbers, then you get to do it again after you've done it the first time. And of course, they'll tell you that their answers are on the website, and please go there. And of course, the answer for your problem is not directly addressed on their website. And one of the company's customer service lines says, we cannot talk to you now. Please contact us through our message system. Really? Folks, I had to do that with three companies. Now, are you letting your anxiety and frustration level get up just by hearing what I'm saying? Frustration is Satan's tool. Frustration is Satan's tool. However, I think if we're honest, many people it doesn't take uh, that much to get them frustrated. And they do not understand they're falling right into Satan's trap. And many people allow frustration to control them every day. So they're out of fellowship with God. And you're not going to get anywhere yelling and screaming at people, especially your spouse and your children. Or calling them names. Now listen carefully to my next point. Many people live in frustration because they've never learned how not to live without frustration. Got it? Many people live in frustration because they've never learned how not to live without it. Therefore, every day is a frustrating experience. Frustration starts a path of destruction. 
Frustration leads to anxiety, worry, anger, bitterness, fear, discouragement, and depression, loss of hope. God does not want us to live a life of frustration because of where it leads and what it says about us and Him to others. I want you to hear what I just said. I'm going to repeat it and I want you to hear it. God does not want us to live a life of frustration because of where it leads and what it says about us and Him to others. In essence, by us living a life of frustration, we're saying our faith in God doesn't matter. It's worthless. Now I need to understand that this is more serious than what we think it is. You know, the Bible says in Philippians 4, 6, be careful or anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Ask Him the question. And notice, I want you to hear verse 7, it says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So the moment you submit, I want to submit myself to, you know, I, okay, I can't get this bottle open. Lord, I want to submit myself to you right now. I want to turn this over to you. What do you want me to praise you for and thank you for? And all of a sudden, the frustration level just goes down. And I start thinking rationally instead of emotionally. So now, is it possible to live a spirit-controlled life always? The answer is yes, instead of living a frustrated life with people and things every day. Have you ever noticed when frustration starts to creep up the back of your neck and you're starting to get anxious and angry? Most of the people we counsel live a life of frustration every day and it leads to a lot of other serious problems in their lives. Now let me go back to my issue with my three devices. So, turn back to 1 Peter 5. Okay, we're going to be done here. 1 Peter 5. Look with me at verse 6. What is the first word in verse 6, folks? Humble. And that word humble means submit. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Humble yourselves, therefore, to God. I'm going to submit myself to God, so I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to submit myself to God. Now, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. See it? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. And the verse that Jacqueline used and learned, and it was a great big help to her with a lot of issues of her life, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. So in essence, I immediately want to turn it over to God, and I want to cast it onto Him. I want to give it to you. Rather than me getting mad and upset, snort, stomp, yell, scream, rant, rave. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil. Whose adversary? Yours. Ours. As a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. Now remember, this morning, I said then who is Satan looking to devour? Anybody remember? What kind of Christians? Somebody said it. I heard it. Christians that were without fellowship with God. Because they've never learned to cast anything over to God. They've never learned to give any care over to God. They just live in frustration every single day. And what does it say about them? What's it say about God? What's it say about Satan's work in their life? Cast all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. At the point of impact, 
submit yourself. And the moment you do that, I'm going to stop. Stop. I'm not going there. Lord, I want to turn this over to you. I want to submit myself to you right now. What do you want me to praise you for? What do you want me to thank you for? And notice what it says in verse 9. When you do that, whom resist, st- talking about Satan, he says, as Satan as a roaring lion walketh by seeking whom he may devour, he says, whom resist steadfast in the faith. So the moment you submit, you're willing to live by what? Faith. Rather than by emotion. Amen? And so, he says here, when fr- now, so think about this. So when frustration comes, rather than go up the frustration ladder to other serious issues, stop, think, turn it over to God, submit it to Him, make God real in your life at the point of impact instead of being out of fellowship with God. And when one of my issues, electronic issues, seemed like it was going to be very difficult to fix, I stopped. And I turned this concern over to God. I said, Lord, I, you know, right now I don't know what to do. I want to turn this over. I need the Holy Spirit's help here. I want to submit myself to you. Because I'm getting nowhere. That was interesting. And immediately as I was praying, God reminded me of something that He had shared with me many years ago. Trust me to do great things in your life. Trust me to do great things in your life. You know, before when Kim and I came here, I prayed and I said, God, I'd like for you to do great things in the lives of people this week. Trust me to do great things in your life. Even in those frustrating moments? Yes, especially in the frustrating moments. Trust me to do great things in your life. So God's interested in the little things of our life. And at that moment, I decided to stop and think and turn it over to God rather than allow frustration to control me. And God immediately gave me a customer service person who took control of the problem and fixed it immediately. Praise God. The just shall live by what? Faith. Rather than frustration. I thank God and I praise Him for His help. And again, He wanted to remind me that I can live by faith. And He will do great things in my life if I do not let the flesh control me. You know? And and Philippians 4, 7, just for the sake of what we're doing here, Philippians 4, 7, I want you to listen. And when you do that, rather than frustration, listen to what this verse says. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God. And remember this morning I talked about Jesus saying, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave to you. Ask Him for the comfort of the Holy Spirit and His peace, please. Submit. Praise God. Psalm 34, 4 says, I sought the Lord and He heard me and He delivered me from all of my fears. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, my life verse says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy path. Because there's a lot of paths out there you can go down. I want to go down the one God wants me to go down. And I want to ask him which path he wants me to go. Hebrews 13.5. Now, I want you to turn back there with that one, if you would, in your Bibles. We're almost done. Don't lose me now. Okay? Because I'm building on something here, okay? And then we're at the climax right now. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15 with me. I want you to notice what it says. By Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of what? Praise to God when? 
That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. So when am I supposed to be doing this, Ben? Continually. Continually at the point of impact. I want to submit myself to you. I want to turn this over to you. What do you want me to praise you and thank you for? Amen? So that I can see God do great and mighty things in my life and not just live a life of defeat and discouragement and frustration and saying, I don't know if it's really worth it living a Christian life. I'm going to tell you what. It's great to live the Christian life if you really want to live it. And you do it by submitting yourself to God, the Holy Spirit who loves you, cares for you, and wants to help you, and you can see God do great and mighty things in your life. Walk out of here tonight realizing that the God of the universe loves you. He wants to help you. You know, we teach our counselees every day to ask God to show him, show them His message for them today in the Word. And as they're reading down the Word and they're looking for something, and there it is, it comes right out of the page, this is God's message for me today. I'm going to write that down. I write it down. And you know what? The God of the universe took His time today to show you what His message was for you. Now that ought to really float your boat. Okay? It ought to make you Baptocostal. It ought to make you really understand that He loves me and He cares for me and He wants to help me. All i got to do here is submit, ask the question, what do you want me to praise you for? What do you want me to thank you for? How do you want me to pray about this? Amen? Now, have you ever noticed the ugliness of a Christian with a bitter and critical spirit? Not a pretty sight. And surely that's not where you wish to be. Generally, they're anger-prone people with an angry spirit. And that's sin as well. Much of this starts with that ugly word, frustration. They do not believe God, and they don't see the possibility of the things that God can do for them. Why? Because they've allowed their frustration, frustration to take them out of fellowship with God. Let me make this plain. You're going to have to pay diligent attention to your fellowship with God, and you cannot be a spirit-controlled person without being in fellowship with God. Now, maybe you saw yourself tonight in what I'm talking about. Now's the time to submit yourself to God. Now, maybe you're here tonight and you don't know for sure if you die tonight, you go to heaven. You know, when the invitation happens, you come on down. Somebody will take the Bible and show you before you leave here that you're a child of God, that you're saved. But maybe you're experiencing difficulty in your life right now because of spiritual and emotional maturity, immaturity. And you don't know, and you're angry at everything around you because of your spiritual and emotional immaturity. Why not come down here tonight and ask God to work in your heart so that you don't have to live in frustration, that you can be a spirit-controlled person, and you can see God do great and mighty things in your life. Now that's your choice. I want God to do great and mighty things in my life, so I don't want to live in frustration. Amen? So why not? Maybe you're here tonight and you're angry at husband, you know, maybe, you know, and I don't know anybody here, you know, other than a couple, two or three of you. But maybe you're here tonight and you're angry at your husband. Over a lot of stuff. Maybe you're angry at your wife over a lot of stuff. Maybe you need to come down here and ask God to show you if there's anything in your life that needs to be corrected. And then you can ask God to work in his or her life and see what happens. Are you willing to trust God with that, or are you just wanting to be angry about it? It's your choice. Now, if you're saved here tonight, 
You ask God that question, He's going to help you. And He's going to encourage you. And, he, you know, and you can ask Him to work in your husband's life. You can ask Him to work in your wife's life. You can ask Him to work in your children's life. And I'm going to go a little bit farther with this. I'll just tell you this. I even encourage our counselees to ask God if there's anything in their child's heart that they need to know. Show it to them. Because I can guarantee you, you're not going to handle it at 17 if you could have handled it at 9. Let's stand together. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed.